I don't want to sound ungrateful, Dad. Yeah, what about a reason to crack open the bubbly? Yeah, but after six weeks with now decent to drink. Well, is you had anything to drink? Oh, we had Pruno. Pruno? Well, it's a sort of hooch. It's made from fermented apples and oranges mixed with boiled sweets. And Maggie, who made it, put a bit of ketchup in it, gave it a spicy note. Really? Of course not. It tasted of bile. <laughs> But it was 9%. It was stronger than special, bro. The talk of the street. 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 Welcome to episode 289 of The Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street Catcher podcast that thinks we've been lucky to have some of the best television of the year to enjoy this week. But that's enough about the traitors, let's talk about Coronation Street, I'm Gavin. Oh, oh. And I'm wondering how our dear ticks got all the way to the United Kingdom without their wee little passports. That's Brexit for you. <laughs> I don't know what that means. No, I'm, I'm, I mean about Brexit's oh, relationship. Oh, okay, all right, all right. okay, okay. I was about ready to be very disappointed in you. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> How are you this week? Ah, anxious. Anxious? Anxious. What are you anxious about? My auction ends on Sunday. Oh, hold on. Maybe this will make you feel better. <laughs> My auction talk. My, the the simulcast of the physical media auction begins at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And I'm just really anxious because I want it to do well. I kind of feel like I need it to do well. And, you know, some things are doing really well. And then other things that should be that should be hitting really high marks aren't. And, and we've done some tweaking over the last month to try to get it to bounce up. And it's not quite doing it yet. So I'm just, I'm really nervous. Even though it's the second most viewed auction also in Michigan. I was going to say, I seem to remember it being very well subscribed. Yeah. It hasn't quite translated into bids yet, though. That's, that's the conversions that's a problem. It's the right. conversions and everything. There are 50, 50 people have, have cl- are, are watching the lot with the, the Batman lot with the... Um, issue the batman comic book which is the first appearance of poison ivy you know so i'm 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 hoping that like it's just gonna go nuts on sunday mm-hmm. i just really want it to go bonkers what typically happens when the auction goes live for the simulcast thing do, well, you, typically, then, do you typically get more bids typically yeah yeah like <laughs> I, I keep you know reminding myself and my boss that last year's book auction, we had uh, promotional photos of the Star Wars holiday special in the auction and um, candid photos of Martin Luther King Jr. at an event in Chicago in, in a photo album. And both of those things crept up to like $200 or so and then just stopped for most of the auction. But then the day of the simulcast, both of them shot up and, and sold for like the, the Martin Luther King Jr. photos. I think they sold for like five grand and the holiday special promotional photos shot up to like eight grand. Oh, so, well, there you go. You know, I'm probably being anxious for nothing, but yeah, this is this, maybe be anxious at lunchtime on Sunday. This if it's is still just, like this. This is just the way I am. There you go. That's fun. <laughs> Enjoy your brain. Yes. Yeah. In fairness, like the, the Batman comic books, there's three of them in the lot and it's already up to $300. So I'm actually happy f- with that. Right. And I'm really anxious because our friends, um, our friends Patsy and Meg, the, the items from their mother's house predominantly are in this in this auction and i really want them to do well oh, sure. because i want our friends to do well 
mm-hmm. you know, so that they can support their mother in in care. So, you know, just the weight of the world on my shoulders. A bit like Paul and the traitors, really. <laughs> sure. Are we talking UK traitors? Yeah, I haven't really been watching the US uh, traitors this season because Alan Cummings. But You watched it last year and it was Alan Cummings. That's because there wasn't another traitors on at the same time. Ah. But the UK one is on, so that's the one that I'm... Plus the US one, it's all reality stars this season. If it's, if it's all... It is. is it's it, all reality stars. Th- they might as well not be because I don't know who any of them are. But yeah. it gives them all a bit of a false confidence that makes it right. maybe not quite so enjoyable. But I've really been enjoying this series of the UK traitors. There was a little dip, I'm not going to lie, but they edit it so well that, mm-hmm. la- that this week particularly has been unmissable. Well, that's excellent. So yeah, I've been really enjoying it. Yeah. Claudia Winkleman is a fabulous host on it. She's so invested in it. She's crying along with them. She's excited with them. She's a brilliant host. Yeah, she's she's great. I'm surprised you didn't want to talk about the traitors on the list of lists this week, as opposed to that terrible Kelly Cuoco movie. I've talked about that before, and I might talk about it this week. So who knows? Who knows? Oh. List of lists, season two, just begun. We are talking about Oscars best pictures this season. So. Yeah, but if you're only interested in color movies, maybe give us a month. <laughs> At least we've we've hit the talkies. <laughs> we have. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be going down actually quite well mm. for our for our new list. So yes. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're no. Here, sadly. No. As a reminder, we're here to talk about Coronation Street. So, shall we preamble, my dear? Yes, please. Give us some of that treacherous Corey Ooh. news. Tony Maudsley is taking a break from George to narrate the new show Around the World in 80 Ways. Oh, I see what they did there. Which frankly sounds terrible, but I'm very happy for him. (laughs) Apparently, these, these um, these two women, these two plump women are traveling around the world to learn how different countries react and and treat obesity. And they're starting in Japan. That's not what I imagined it would be at all. All ways, W-E-I-G-H-T. Correct. Yes. Okay. No T. No T. That'll be weights. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've you got thought you 80 ways, like traveling in 80 different kinds of yeah. vehicles? Yeah, because say after the first 10, you're going to be struggling. <laughs> Roller skates. I don't know, maybe one of those uh, those bouncy ball things <laughs> with the little horns that comes out of it, whatever they're called. Hobby horses, I think. Or hobbity. Hobbity horses? Hippity hoppity? They're not horses, are they? They're just balls. No, but like uh, like one of those horses that oh, gymnasts uh, flip something over else? Yeah. are also not shaped like actual horses. So, I don't know. Are we just listing things that aren't shaped like horses now? <laughs> we could be here for a while. <laughs> yeah. Initially, an interesting sounding concept, and now less so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure Tony Maudsley will will make it interesting. Though. Right, yes, with his narration. Mm-hmm. Sally and Kev are going nowhere, as Sally Diviner and Michael Lavelle have signed new contracts to stay on Corey for another year. Surprise, surprise. Quel surprise. Apparently Ken Barlow is also not going anywhere. That's right. They might as well just sign. What else is he going to do? Retire? Enjoy his golden years? I'm sure he probably enjoys turning up and seeing all his friends and travel, getting paid for sitting in a chair and saying something pithy every now and again to Daniel. I mean, if that was your job, you'd you'd just keep on doing it, wouldn't you? No, I think if if I was making his money, I would probably I would probably retire. And finally, Sue Cleaver had a happy reunion with former co-star Nicola Thorpe, whose new baby girl. Born last week is Sue's new goddaughter. Oh, isn't, isn't that, that sweet? Lovely. That is lovely. That is lovely that they, you know, that they're still so close to one another. It's just it was it's such a cute photo too. It's really funny that the characters that kind of share storylines mm-hmm. kind of become sort of family for each other. Yeah, and that's Corey news. That's Corey news, and 
I don't know, for all your anxiety, Helen, you still managed to provide an absolutely seamless segue. I do what I do. Into the feedback section that I like to call Everyone's a Critic. So Debbie got back in touch. Oh no. You may remember Debbie from last week's Everyone's a Critic who I think had had reached the end of her tether with the old, but not like that, <laughs> meme or trope. She writes, exactly like that, I couldn't help laughing. Thanks for <laughs> oh, the God. chuckle, another great show. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much, David. I was so worried that she was going to hate it. <laughs> I was so worried that she was going to get so pissed off at us, kind of. I think we tried to piss her off, didn't we? <laughs> well, no. Didn't we? <laughs> Oh, I must have missed that meme. I'm sorry. And we did it. She had a good laugh. She did. So yeah. I love I love our listeners because I don't think I don't think we've had one yet who's like an asshole. Then Ian Les Paul wrote in. <laughs> he wrote a longer email. Actually, Lots of people wrote longer things this week that I've had to cut down for reasons that we'll get to. But Ian Les Paul wrote, It was nice to be remembered this week. Thank you so very much. I put Helen's lack of memory down to too much auction talk. Wishing you both a happy and healthy 2024. Thank you so much. And Ian Les Paul is a name that should be easy to remember. Yeah, well, there's a guitar right there. Right, there's a guitar yeah, right there. Yeah. None of them are Les Paul's. No. Either, but... The, the, the I was about clues. ready to say, that's a Fender. It's not Ian Telecaster. <laughs> or maybe it is. Maybe it is. Then Cheeky wrote in, I didn't know whether you knew this or not, but the actress that plays Sarah Platt and the actor that plays Damon have worked together before in a show called Waterloo Road. Yes, we knew that. So they have a lot of great chemistry from their previous interaction. And it so shows, doesn't it? Yeah. I believe we, we talked about that when he first started on the show last year. Yeah, I think we may have. I don't like the fact that Damon has basically won over Sarah after Adam literally chasing after her. I loved the random mention of soft play this week. That was hilarious for me. It was hilarious for me as well. I think I kind of punched the air a little bit at that. Aha! And then finally, splendidly done, sent us this clip from the Greg James BBC Radio 1 breakfast show. Ooh. Good tune of the week from Ariana Grande. She has returned. That's Greg James. The first new music we've heard from her in years. She's been very busy being on stage and filming, uh, what is it, the Wicked musical. Which, weirdly, yes. she's been filming it in, like, Boreham Wood in, in Hertfordshire. The idea of Ariana Grande walking around Boreham Wood is yeah. sort of amazing. But she's back with new music. I'm playing this for you every day this week. And I've just noticed, hang on a second. Oh, yeah, the intro is... 23 seconds. My compilation of London's is 24 seconds, so by my reckoning... I'm on my way to London. London? She's on her way to London. I'll London! I've got to London this afternoon. I'll be out your air then. London? University College London. London? I'm going to London. London? Going where? London. London? I've been banging on the Barlow's door for ages, isn't the answer? No, 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 she's in London. London? That's what you call not crashing the vocal. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's very well done. Those, those are, that's our clip. Not yes. his, but it's okay. We'll share it with well, him. Well, our clip is 37 seconds long. So he has a shorter version of that. Yeah, because he doesn't have the dubby bit, which no. is my favourite part. Yeah. So, thanks for sending that and spending a little done because when that was happening, I was asleep. <laughs> Feedback is always welcome. Send us your thoughts and I will probably read them out. Get us at thetalkofthestreet at gmail.com or our DMs are always open at Cory Podcast. And now we'll podcast after coffee. <laughs> Thanks to John Giovinacci for our coffees this week. Oh, thank you, John. See, another one of our listeners who's not an asshole. <laughs> well done, John. Well played. Yes. Hey, guys, it's about time I got you both a coffee for all the laughs that you give me listening to your podcast every Sunday. Also wishing you a happy new year. 
Phew, I think I just about beat the Larry David cutoff point for saying that. <laughs> Cheers, John. Thank you so much, John. We very much appreciate that. I oh, am do. drinking a pineapple Fanta tonight. For some reason, over the Christmas break, you have you have you have found the love of of Fanta, of pineapple Fanta. I love a fucking Fanta. And I love a pineapple Fanta in particular. It kinda tastes like Lilt that was a, a favourite of mine. In my formative years. Ah. What I like most about Fanta uh, Pineapple, though, is that it says quite clearly on the on the tin... Contains no juice. Contains no juice. Yes. <laughs> Orange Fanta says the same thing. 100% artificial. Yes. Enjoy your death. <laughs> and I'm drinking cranberry juice. Which does contain juice. Yes. Lots of juice. The Talk of the Street is and will always be free on your podcast provider and on YouTube. But so if you think a show is worth anything more than the time it takes to listen to it, and if you want to show your appreciation, you can buy us next week's coffee by going to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. You can also sign up to be a friend of the podcast through the same link where for as little as two bucks a month you can get a mention in the closing credits of each and every episode. But remember, you can always support the podcast for free and get us in front of new listeners by liking, subscribing, rating, and reviewing wherever you get your podcasts. And now, this. I remember to do it this week. Good job. Bravo. I do try. A welcome, welcome, welcome. And welcome to Last Year Tonight with me, John Oliver. Just enough time to quickly talk about Shepherd of the Anus. <laughs> Shepherd of the Anus? What a good one to come back for. Ho oh, ho! That's what she said. <laughs> like that. <laughs> is, is this when uh, David decided to buy a flock of sheep? That's right. This was Bernie explaining that she used to do Egyptian therapies at festivals. And she was known as the Shepherd of the Anus. Oh, Bernie. Oh, Bernie. I was Gavin and you had thoughts. I did. Dirty, filthy thoughts. And disappointed thoughts. Wait, dirty, filthy thoughts? About who? I'm assuming it was about you. No, it was because you were cataloguing Turkish exploitation movie posters. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's the second time we've said that sentence or something like it in this <laughs> podcast. That's about Coronation Street. We got talking about stairs to nowhere in the middle of nowhere for some reason. And then talked about whether Harry Potter deserved to be tortured by his aunt and his uncle. I thought, yes, you weren't convinced. Summer finds herself locked in the nursery of a man ill-equipped to deal with her medical requirements. Hope is distraught when her John Stape tape gets chewed up by her cassette player. When Daisy continues to receive unsolicited flowers, she is determined to keep quiet about her flirtations with a hotel DJ. Jacob's swift departure leaves disappointed people on the street and some unanswered questions at the bistro. After minding glory for Michael, Gemma finally stumbles on an opportunity to make some extra money. Stephen keeps a close eye on Teddy, whose slowly returning memory threatens to lead him to the truth about Cinco Leo. Damon loves a swivelly chair. Who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Keith wishes he was You're gay. You're right now. Uh -huh. And Bernie sniffs milk. Our moment of the week was <laughs> That's funny. Paul and Todd talking about how Kel still plagues Paul's thoughts. And our boring moment of the week was Sarah wanting to print labels at the factory. And that was Coronation Street <laughs> and the Talk of the Street this time last year. We'll take a quick break, but we'll be right back with this week's recap. And we're back. Woohoo! Oh, that was a good break. Shall we dive in, my dear? Yes, please. Our first storyline tonight is Damon Bad Omens 2. This one's come back. So on Monday, Damon and Sarah have got their hole again, and he spent the night. Woohoo! She doesn't waste any time. No. It seems that they're a couple now, and because of that, Sarah wants to drag him to the regular plat meeting at the bistro. Damon agrees, but he has to go and see Harvey first, and has a plan of attack that might allow him to stick around. It's not much of a plan. It's not really a plan at all, is it? <laughs> Adam and Didi are chatting outside the law office. She's off to the prison to visit a next client, which Adam thinks is a poor indictment of her services. Then he eyes up suspiciously as he sees Sarah and Damon walking very together-like down the cobbles. What well? So later in prison, Dee Dee is with her client, but sees the altercation between Damon and Harvey during the visit. Harvey plays dumb about the cubed motor from last week when Damon insists that they're square now. 
But when Damon goes literally. to literally, yeah, see what that literally square. But when Damon goes to leave, Harvey very subtly threatens Sarah and Harry, and Damon eventually has to be dragged away by the prison guards. Dee Dee is shocked by this. Her client, though, thinks it's hilarious. And for his troubles, later, Harry will stuff his special sock down this guy's Harvey, throat. Harvey, Harvey. Harry is into soft play. <laughs> That's so easily get confused. <laughs> but see, just watch... Walk towards the guy swinging his sock. I uh-huh. suppose there was supposed to be like a pool ball or something down it, or, or a couple of pool soap. balls. But I don't think it'd be soap, would it? Why not? Soap to is bash hard. To over the head. Soap is hard and easy to get. Bar of soap. Everybody's so into body wash these days. Nobody, nobody knows. That's all anyone's talking about is body wash. The heft of soap. So back in the rolls, Dee Dee tells Adam about what she overheard. And the beast wrote, Gail, Audrey and Nick gossip about Sarah being with Damon. And when Sarah arrives, everyone thinks that she's mental going out with the gangster, so much so that Nick begins to softly weep. <laughs> with that, Damon arrives and tries to be polite, but an irate Adam arrives later and says that he doesn't want Damon staying over again or being anywhere near Harry. Sarah reminds him that this is none of his fucking beeswax, and Harry isn't even his kid. Ouch. Oh, I mean, it's true, but... Do you say that to him? No. Do you? No. So quickly into this stupid relationship Ouch. with this gangster guy. And Audrey keeps calling him Damien, which is hilarious. Yes, that was quite funny. Nick begs for calm and escorts Adam to the door. Nick agrees with Adam. He doesn't want Damon near his family too, but this isn't the way to get Sarah to change her mind. Instead, Adam goes back to the office and calls the prison to arrange a visit with Harvey, who he pretends is his client. Sarah quickly regrets her words. Adam is the closest Harry's had to a dad and this is enough to set Nick off again. Gail thinks Damon should leave, but Sarah announces that they're a couple and folk need to get used to the idea. Then David comes in, but he is immediately sent off to check on Adam. (laughs) So David checks on Adam and tells him that everyone agrees with him that Damon's bad news and Sarah's pretty thick when you think about it. And there's nothing much to do to change her mind until she changes it herself. Right, yeah. That the more... The more you tell her it's a bad idea, the more she digs her heels in. Are you surprised at how quickly she's kind of all in on this? He must be really, really, really good in the sack. Then you just stay in the sack. You don't introduce something to Gail. <laughs> yes. There, there must be something there that belies his, his stature. Well, sometimes it goes that way. <laughs> I don't know, it just seems... She's kind of behaving like they've been dating for like a year. They were kind of in an illicit relationship already before and she was pregnant with his baby. So maybe they uh, maybe. maybe they can skip some of, the, some of the niceties. Yeah, maybe getting her pregnant means that they can skip the formalities a little bit. Yes. So Adam goes to see Harvey in jail... And they have a loaded conversation about Damon. He's neither of their favourite people and Adam wants to know what they're going to do about it. Harvey suggests he joins a queue. He doesn't mind getting his hands dirty, but Adam just wants Damon scared off. And in return, he'll represent him in an appeal and he's willing to bend the rules and the law if necessary. Ooh. Outside, Sarah sees Adam when he gets back and she apologises for what she said. Adam seems to accept it until he learns that Damon has taken Harry to football practice but she doesn't want him to think that she's doing any of this to hurt Adam and promises that he can see Harry whenever. Yes. So Just Adam not is, right now. So Adam is hanging out with Dee Dee's. Is Adam living at Dee Dee's now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, remember they moved in together. No, I don't remember they because moved before Christmas. somebody else moved into Dee Dee's. No, it was, it was Adam well before Ed. Christmas. Ed moved into Dee Dee's. Right, but Adam was already there. Adam moved in when he left Sarah. So this has been a while ago. And remember, we were very worried that they were going to start hooking up, the oh, two yeah, of them? Oh, yeah, I do remember that. They talk about the Damon situation, how Adam has decided to keep his nose out of it from now on. But then he gets a call from Harvey, who has decided to take Adam up in his offer. He'll take care of Damon, but if he does, Adam's going to owe him. Capiche? Adam capiches. So Wednesday... And Nina's rolls Adams with Dee Dee and Alia. The legal office has a burst pipe, always with the burst pipe. The women folk quiz Adam about his mystery new client. He tells them that he's meeting at a hotel in town and thanks them to keep their noses out. This Sarah comes in 
and they tell him to be nice. He says he is nice. Be nicer then. And he arranges to pick up Harry for tea tonight. Aw. Now let's talk about the burst pipe at the law office and the conversation earlier on in the week outside the law office yeah. is making me worry that the law office has gone the same way as the undertaker's. That there isn't an interior anymore. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I was just, I was just weirded up because, because this is, this is two plumbing incidents in one week, in different houses. Although I suppose one of them is more an electrical issue, but both involve water getting on the floor. Adam goes to see Harvey in the neck. He wants some good news. Adam has some questions for Harvey to build a case for his sentence and to be unsafe. Harvey smells a rat here, thinks that Adam's stalling, and reminds him of the consequences of not holding up his end of the deal, and Adam shuts himself a wee bit. Meanwhile, Sarah meets Damon on the street. Seems there's been a change of plan. She needs to give Izzy a bollock and it works, so needs Adam to pick Harry up from school, but Adam's not answering his phone. No problemo, says Damon. Who's got two thumbs and can pick up Harry? This guy, he says. And Sarah's like, are you just from heaven being able to pick up a kid from school? And Damon says, you betcha, baby. <laughs> so Adam runs through... I the mean, they're basically the same height, so it should be easy. He is a bit of a short arse, isn't he? This is why I said Marvel should be calling him to be the next Wolverine. Or Ant-Man. Ant-Man's actually taller than Wolverine. Not when he's an ant, he's not... Oh, that's right, because Ant-Man is suddenly like 60 feet tall, because that makes sense. Yes, he can do both. So, Adam, that's how pin particles work. Yeah, <laughs> Bullshit. You love Paul Rudd. Stop it. They spoiled what was a, a good bit of a franchise I dislike. Mm. So, Adam runs through the timeline for the appeal, which could take up to a year. That's not going to go down well with Harvey. No. He says, you think I've got a year? Well, you're currently serving life, so right. maybe you do. This makes Harvey suspicious again, but he needs Adam to be the go-between to pay the guy off who's going to remove Damon from the picture. Adam wants to bail on this, but it's too late for that. The wheels are in motion, and the guy needs to beat someone up. He doesn't care if it's Damon or Adam. Adam's suddenly worried about what this is going to do for his business if he gets caught doing this. Right. Well, don't get caught then, says Harvey. Yeah. And that seems to be the difference between criminals and law-abiding people. Uh-huh. You understand the risks... And then do it anyway. Right. Even though there's a lot of CCTV everywhere. Only only if the plot says so. <laughs> Meanwhile, Damon picks up Harry and takes him to the bistro. Harry doesn't seem to like Damon at first and just wants to go home. But Damon explains to Harry how much he enjoyed getting his hole off of his mum. And this would be much easier if Harry is on side about it. So Harry agrees. <laughs> Adam, who doesn't work at the factory, turns up at the factory to find out what the score is. But Harry, where is he? I'm, I'm supposed to be taking him for his tea. Sarah explains that she called and texted him, and Damon picked him up from school. Adam loses his rag about this, so Sarah calls Damon to find out where they are. Eventually, Damon gets Harry back, and Harry is high as fuck on sugar and chips, and he announces, and helium. I've got a new balloon! <laughs> and helium. <laughs> Adam still isn't happy because his arrangement was for tea. Sarah suggests bowling or maybe soft play. Bowling! shouts Harry. So they leave for bowling and Sarah has a look that suggests maybe she thinks Damon is at it. I absolutely adore Harry. If I haven't made that clear before, I just love the way that he shouts all these lines. I know, it's so cute. And everyone else that's in the scene is pretending that he isn't. <laughs> He's just a very excited child. It's so believable. <laughs> He's got a new balloon. He wants to take I've his got new balloon. A new balloon. No, no, balloon cannot go bowling because it's a soccer ball, not a bowling ball. More lines for Harry, please. <laughs> just give that kid as much as he can handle. I think he can handle more. Yeah. He's doing well. He is doing well. I'll be really sad when he gets a new head. I know, because it's because they it's always almost get new inevitable, heads. isn't it? Yeah. He's going to get to like. Nine or ten, and then that'll be it. They'll get somebody else. Although that doesn't happen with all of them. Some of the some of the J named kids are still the same as they were. The J gang. The J gang. The J posse. The J gang. So Sarah accuses Damon of deliberately winding Adam up. 
she does need the aggro, and if he cares what she thinks, he'll drop it. Adam goes home to complain to Didi and Alia about Damon's antics. They both think that Harry loves Adam, which he does, and nothing's going to change that. The women leave to get booze, which lets Adam call Harvey to confirm that he's happy to be the go-between after all. So on Friday, Adam and Toya are chatting about Peter and Nina's roles and how Simon's always out drinking with his mates these days. Uh-oh. Keep on laying this down. Just other little yep. dropping the hints that Simon's going to have a drinking problem. The mood changes when Sarah and Damon come in. Damon apologises again for yesterday and offers his hand. The men shake their willies at each other. No hard feelings, though. Forget about it. Uh-huh. And then Adam wipes his hand on his jacket. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, messed up. Outside, Adam takes a call from the grunt that Harvey has set him up with and they arrange to meet at the precinct to hand over the lovely cash. So at the precinct, Adam pays the thugs that's going to do Damon over. Adam reminds him not to kill him or anything, just working his kidneys a bit. When the thug goes, Adam has another panic attack. Sarah sees him because she's passed in, in the precinct and recognises what's wrong with him. He tells her that she doesn't have to worry about him anymore, but she says she still cares. And he quickly leaves for a supposed meeting elsewhere. At Dee Dee's, Adam calls Harvey in the nick. He's worried that people are going to find out what he's done, so he needs Damon taken care of sharpish. Harvey doesn't seem to be working to the same timetable, though. It sounds like he wants his appeal sorted out first. And that's as far as we get with that this week. I don't know why people keep going to Harvey for things. Because it never works out the way you <laughs> want it. seldom delivers. Right. No. It would be different if Adam had a bad track record at getting rid of Damon. But... He succeeded the last time. Yeah, but then Damon came back and almost killed him and kidnapped him. What does he think is going to happen this time? If he was smart, if he really wanted to get rid of Damon, he would get rid of Damon. But he's adamant not to. Right, because obviously he wants to be kidnapped and murdered again. He did seem to enjoy himself the last time. His hair was a terrible mess, though. It was. It was cute. Yeah, I don't know why he's... If he's going to go this way, he really has to go all in and, right. and absolutely get rid of him. And it's so weird because he doesn't want Sarah back, I don't think. So this is all for Harry? I don't know. Because let's remember, Adam's the one who left Sarah. Not the other way around. Well, 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 Sarah cheated on Adam. And then she apologized and said, you're the one that I want. Ooh, 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 honey. The one that I want? <laughs> honey. The one I need? <laughs> no. The one I need. Yes, indeed. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Summer loving had me All a right, blast. All right, no, enough, okay. enough. It, it's, it, the moment's passed. Damn it. I wish I was better at recognising that. Yeah, it happened so fast. <laughs> Uh, see, this John is paying good money for these laughs, by the way. Yes. Anyway, what the fuck were we talking about? We were talking about Adam trying to get rid of Damon, but not right. But so not murdering, but not having somebody actually kill him, which is dumb because if you don't kill him, he's going to kidnap you again and have you shot. And I, actually, the next time, he's actually going to have you shot. It is just like cockroaches. If you don't kill them all, then they're going to come back. He, right. he needs to kill he needs to kill Damon. But I f- think where we'd got to, though, was why Why does he want to? Right. Because cause Damon shagged his missus mm-hmm. and got her up the duffage. Yes. Which is never going to take very well, Adam. No. But no. Adam kind of gets him beaten up and almost killed. Right. Damon then gets his revenge by kidnapping and could have killed Adam, but right. then doesn't. Yeah. So does it? It kind of feels that like they're square now. As yeah, just like Damon's car. They've, they've had, they've had a go. They've survived to tell the tale. It feels like if they if they don't draw a line under it, then someone is going to get killed. Hmm. I blame Dee Dee. This is Dee Dee's fault, after all. It is Dee Dee's fault, because she's the one who told Adam about the altercation between Harvey and Damon in prison. And it wasn't really until Adam found out that Sarah and Harry's lives are in danger, thanks to Damon, Mm -hmm. that he seemed to really care again. So it's Dee Dee's fault. And Dee Dee should have known that this was going to generate a reaction out of Adam. 
Yeah, it, the, the person she should have told is Sarah. Yep. Not Adam. Yeah, because Sarah thinks that all this is going to take is for Damon to turn over a new leaf and then they're safe. Right. And that's not really the case. No, no. Sarah has no idea about... Well, she does have an idea. Because he, he, he came and he told her, I've got to go away because somebody cubed my car. <laughs> but, and if I stay with you, you're in danger. He said that to her and she does not seem to care. That penis must be amazing. <sighs> and those leather trousers, let's not forget. It's a good uh, combination. Yeah. Because they just wipe clean. <laughs> just take a wee shammy to them and they will buff up nicely. All right. I feel like we are unfocused tonight. So let's move on to our next storyline. That I don't think it's going to focus on any more. Big Fridge, Wee Kitchen. On Monday, Gemma turns up at the quad house and hears that Granny Linda is on her way. They can tell because there's a, a northerly wind coming in. The plan is to tell her that Gemma is staying with Paul to help with his care. And this is the second time Chesney has used Paul as an excuse or a lie. Right. Poor wee Joseph is feeling poorly again, but when Gemma tells Chesney, he doesn't want to fucking hear it. Not this bullshit again. At the god flat, Gemma catches Paul watching the Kardashians. I kind of thought that Paul would be in the Kardashians. Yeah, why wouldn't he? Gemma tells him about Joseph and Paul reckons that Gemma needs to tread carefully here because if social services catch wind of this, it might affect her case if she makes a big deal out of it. And then there's rolls. And see, this is the problem. Right. Now that this is a, a continuing situation... She's the last person that can mention it because right. they're still investigating this. God knows right. how long later. Yeah. Still investigating this. So this is kind of a cloud that's hanging over her. That if right. Joseph was to get run down in the street, it better be Chesney that takes him to the hospital because right. if Gemma does it, they're not going to believe her. Right. And they're going to think she's the one who ran him down in the street. Oh. And then rolls. Joseph still isn't feeling great and doesn't laugh at Paul's shite patter. When Gaddis comes in, Gemma tries to have a word with her, but Gaddis is bored of this already. And then Chesney comes in and is embarrassed that Gemma is bugging the doctor outside of surgery hours. Gaddis seems to take it in stride, though. She's kind of like, as long as you're not going to drop trowel and, <laughs> yes. and, and show me your ass, you're fine. Which has happened. Yes. Chesney drags Gemma. In real life. Chesney drags Gemma home to shout at her while smelling of kebabs. Gemma says that she just mentioned it to Gaddis because she was there, but Chesney echoes Paul's thoughts earlier and tells her to think about things before attempting to ruin everything. Later, there's a knock at the door, and the whole gang is there when Granny Linda arrives. So Gemma leaves with Paul, using him as an excuse. And once they're gone, Granny Linda reveals the extent of her granny powers when she announces that she doesn't believe a word of anything that's going on and demands to be brought up to speed, so Chesney... Grassy's Gemma up. Yeah, fuck him. What the hell, Chesney? Yeah. What the hell? Just because she says, I know something's wrong. We'll just say there isn't. There isn't. And it's none of your business. None of your fucking business. Granny Linda doesn't believe in accidents and thinks Gemma is an idiot. She asks if he wants Gemma back and offers to pay for him to go for sole custody of the kids. Right, yeah, this escalates so So quickly. quickly. Zero to a (laughs) hundred in one sentence. And all of a sudden... We don't like Granny Linda anymore. I loved Granny Linda. She used to be great. It was like, and she she made her peace with Bernie at the wedding and everything. They they seem to have forgotten that everyone has made their peace with Granny Linda. She kind of, uh, it's not that she overstays her welcome, but she's she's very opinionated. Yes. And... She thinks that what she knows is best. She's always been like that, but it was kind of a more endearing quality right. before when she was interfering with the, the wedding and stuff. Right, yeah, and she throws her money around. Right. Which, you know, sometimes can be helpful. And that's the role of the grandparent. Right. But here, talking about custody. Right, and... Behind Gemma's back. And divorce. With Chesney. Right, She's putting all her eggs in the Chesney basket. Yeesh. Ugh. 
he's outraged by this and maybe not as fucking furious as he should be, though. But when he says Gemma is his wife and his life. On Wednesday, breakfast time at the Quad House, Granny Linda slips Chesney a business card for a solicitor just in case he's changed his mind about totally fucking over Gemma. Right. Chesney tears it up and tells her she can fuck off if she brings this up again. Right. It also seems like the fridge is fucked, which might explain why Joseph is feeling so sick. Yes, it's hilarious that a year ago this week, Bernie was sniffing the milk. (laughs) Yes, she was. And then this year, this week... Maybe somebody should have sniffed the milk before putting it on cereal. Gemma comes to get the kids to take them to school. Joseph is still complaining about feeling sick and Gemma is shocked that the fridge is broken. Gemma suggests going to the chemist to see if they have something for Joseph's poor tum-tum. Dr. Gaddis is heading to the bookies or the tattoo parlour or something and she watches on with interest. When Chesney gets home, he's shocked to discover that Granny Linda has bought a big fuck-off American-style fridge. Seriously? Which obviously doesn't fit in Chesney's tiny wee kitchen. Not at all! What they had was a little under-the-counter fridge. Yeah, yeah, one of those cute little British fridges. Cute little British fridges. Right next to the cute little British washing machine, did you notice? Yes, and the cute little dishwasher. (laughs) Don't know if there's a dishwasher in that flat. Or that, that kitchen. Right, yeah. It's so adorable having your washing machine in your kitchen. It's so cute. This isn't a thing in the in the US. Have you you've been in a number of American houses? I have. Where have you seen washing machines? In the basement or in a special washroom? Yes. Have or you... in or in a hallway outside the toilet in your mum's house for some reason. Well, now they're in the new toilet. Are they? In yeah. the toilet. Well, they're not in the toilet, but they're in the bathroom. Okay. Remember that she's got that big, massive bathroom now that used to be Lance's bedroom? Mm-hmm. This tickles you. Yeah. And Lance's bedroom is now the old living room, which she was going to make her bedroom, but she's still upstairs. I don't know what your mom's playing at. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It's a tiny little fridge. It's so cute. And what she's bought is a big fuck-off American double fridge. It's so big it's so big it you it doesn't fit in the shot i don't think chesney could reach the top shelf on it it does not fit in the shot (laughs) how where are they going to put this it's bigger than our fridge oh it's much bigger than we don't have a particularly big fridge right but we have a fridge that's bigger than a british fridge sure (laughs) our fridge doesn't fit under the counter my understanding was that Chesney is so outraged by this <laughs> that he wants to get rid of it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. No, no. Somehow somehow they're going to make it work. Chesney needs it sent back, but Granny Linda says it's non-refundable. Right, because it was a, it was display, a display model. Bottle, but and oh. she, and she claims that she didn't know the dimensions of she's it. She's got before eyes. She bought it. She's got eyes. I, I think maybe she bought it online, but there should have been a picture and the dimensions written in the description. You know that that's still going to fit under a counter. Yeah. I'm getting quite Scottish as I'm getting more <laughs> outraged there. Did you notice? Yes. It's kind of hot. <laughs> Oof. You calm myself down here. Maybe not. For now. <laughs> okay. She's just called Gemma as if she's losing her mind. Uh-huh. She's bought that fridge thinking it's going to fit in that kitchen. Right. It's the size of the kitchen. If that if that goes in the kitchen, nothing else is going in the kitchen. And for some reason she blames Gemma for the for the fridge going going kablooey. Yep. Like somehow she she even is a it finds a way to blame Gemma for that. Buy a wee fridge for them. Right. Buy a cute little how wee they, fridge. How they can put enough stuff in that fridge for seven people. Did, do they have like a shed out back they could put in the shed like we have? Because we have two refrigerators. <laughs> I forgot about that. Not only do we have a big American <laughs> fridge it's in the not kitchen. that big. Well, it's bigger than a British fridge. <laughs> We have another American fridge in the garage for excess meat, for meat storage 
and beverage storage and popsicle storage during the summer. I throw boxes of popsicles in there so while the kids are out running around with their friends, they can just hit the fridge and get a popsicle. They're for you, I'll admit it. <laughs> They're not for me. But still, we have two refrigerators. I feel like we're, we're bragging a little bit now. <laughs> Most people in this area of the country have two refrigerators. Most people have two refrigerators because they also hunt. And so they need some place to put their deer meat. Mm. Linda is, is antagonized when Chesney tells her, why don't you buy a washing machine that I can stick behind the sofa? And she storms upstairs in a mood, pardon me for caring, she says. Yeah, care a little more conscientiously. So what's she time. going to do? Because she's a grown-ass adult, she packs and she threatens to leave. Chesney apologises and asks her to stay and asks that she checks with him before she makes any decisions, though. And this triggers Linda and they get in turn into Gemma again. And this Gemma comes in wondering why there's an enormous fridge in the living room and then wondering why there's a torn-up business card for a custody lawyer stuck on it. How very fucking hell, she says. Chesney tries to explain, but there's no way to make it sound good, so Gemma is furious that Linda is against her. Chesney really does believe all of this is in her head and that Chesney told Linda about the poisoning in the first place. Linda thinks that Gemma is losing her mind, but let's not forget, Gemma wasn't the one who bought a fridge bigger than the kitchen. <laughs> she storms out, leaving Chesney to take a call from school. Apparently, would you believe it, Joseph isn't feeling well. So Kirk comes in to take care of the fridge while Joseph pukes his ring in the bathroom. The plan isn't to get rid of the fridge. The plan is to move the fridge into a corner of the living room. That seems to be the plan, which would mean it's never in shot. Because it's kind of up against where the fourth wall is going to be. Ah. But. Still. You want to have a big fuck off fridge in your living room? Well, it's kind of like more the dining room part of the living room, though, isn't it? I don't think that house is big enough to have such designation. Well, you know, where the table is, where they all eat around sometimes. Later. Joseph is in a bad way still, and no one seems to give a fuck about it until Joseph. Passes out and dies on the couch. Again. Remember he did this already? <laughs> yes. Chesney and Linda argue over who should call for an ambulance. <laughs> At the hospital, Chesney leaves an angry message for Gemma to call him back. They're doing tests on Joseph. Granny Linda is worried that Gemma poisoned him again with whatever she picked up at the chemist. Oh, do shut up, says Chesney. In the rovers, Gemma's ignoring her buzzing phone. Dr Gadas comes in to ask how Joseph is doing, suddenly interested for some reason. Gemma explains the symptoms and Dr Gadas initially recommends some Prozac and antibiotics for the wee man, but then asks if he's been in the countryside recently. And he has. But before they can get further into it, Gemma's phone rings again. She angrily answers it and finds out exactly what's happened. So Gadas and Gemma rush to the hospital. Gadas goes to speak to the doctor while Chesney fills Gemma in. No, settle. Linda accuses Gemma of poisoning... Exactly like that. <laughs> Linda accuses Gemma of poisoning Joseph again and thinks Chesney agrees with her. Linda is a right cow for a bit while Chesney is steamrolled until Gadas and the hospital doctor come out to share a theory. Lyme disease. Joseph has ticks. No. Gadas congratulates Gemma for putting her onto the theory. Linda tries to sneak out. The hospital will start on the antibiotics and are hopeful... Gadda suggests a quick we go on the Prozac too. He should be right as rain in no time. Chesney rubs Gemma's shoulder. Will he be able to And walk she again? looks at him like he's an absolute piece of shit. Now, can I just say how adorable it is to hear Lyme disease explained to people who have no idea what Lyme disease is? Yeah. <laughs> because Lyme disease is named after a town in Connecticut, the state that I grew up in. It's named after Old Lyme. And in Connecticut, there are more people who have had Lyme disease than have not had Lyme disease. Oh, everybody, really? everybody in my nuclear family has had Lyme disease. I've had Lyme disease. My mother has had Lyme disease. My father has had Lyme disease. My sister has had Lyme disease. I, I get the idea. And my two brothers have had Lyme disease. In fact, my brother Stephen had it so bad that he developed a seizure disorder. That, that's how he got his seizure disorder, because he had Lyme disease. I don't know. And, <laughs> and this isn't the first time we've talked about Lyme disease. Which, which, is basic, which basically ruined his life, because he wanted to go into the military, and then he couldn't go into the military, 
because he had a seizure disorder. And, and they don't let you in the military if you have a seizure. Uh, that, that can join the dots, Haley. Right, yeah. Which threw him into a depression and, and now he's homeless. Um, Any more of his personal life you'd like to share with the <laughs> listeners? No, but it's just... It's funny because, like, for the longest time, there was no Lyme disease here in Michigan. And now it's slowly becoming a, a problem here in Michigan. Like, our dog got Lyme disease here in Michigan. And our, our vet said it was the first case that she's ever treated when Teddy got Lyme disease. So to, to just hear it explained it like, like a brand new thing, you know, and, and them ticking all the boxes like the, the bullseye mm-hmm. and everything. Um, it, it's just, it's just really fascinating. And it, and it is, it is really fascinating to think that deer ticks from America have made it to the United Kingdom somehow, probably well, traveling on people and, and animals, it's dogs. Freddie Laker and cut price transatlantic flights. Hmm. You're welcome. You're welcome, United Kingdom. You're welcome for a, di- finally, finally, someone has given you a disease. That you didn't have before. First, we give you five guys burgers and fries. And now we give and, you Lyme disease. And Krispy Kreme. And now you get Lyme disease. You're welcome. You have to take the bad with the good, right? Right. Oh. Yeah. This is our answer to that whole smallpox problem. Linda apologizes, but it's too little too late for Gemma, who accuses Linda of trying to get Joseph back to Portugal and reminds them all that she's the only one who believed Joseph right from the start. And Linda leaves with her tail between her legs. Chesney apologises to Gemma too, but she's about as happy with him as she was with Linda. At least Bernie would have stuck up for her, she says. She's had no support from Chesney at all and doesn't know if she can ever forgive him. I wouldn't forgive him. You surprise me. <laughs> and not just for this. On, fr- on Friday, Chesney has slept at Joseph's bedside to make up for not believing a word his son had said over the last few weeks. The consultant comes in to confirm Lyme disease. Joseph should be fine, but they need to keep him in for some observation for a day or two. Gemma reckons that he'd be better a lot sooner if folk had believed her. Chesney wants to get on the phone to the the social pronto and get Caitlin sorted out. Joseph wakes up a bit later and seems to be in a bit of a fucking mood with Chesney and will only communicate through Gemma. She goes home to get some games to keep Joseph amused, which leaves him sitting with Tweedle fucking dumb over there. So, back in the street, Caitlin visits Gemma at home and she reads that a riot actor and explains the impact of being separated from her kids for weeks while Caitlin's fannied around writing a non-existent report. Let's see that report, shall we? Let's see how far in you are. Gemma demands to know when she can get home. Meanwhile, Dev is in Nina's rolls over the moon because thanks to the revolving door of the justice system, Bernie's getting home. <laughs> he's so excited, he's put price stickers on his nips. Well... On his jacket, on his nips. Right. And probably on his actual nips. Yes. And his wee man. <laughs> Other God flat, Billy For and Paul Bernie to remove with her teeth. Are excited about seeing Bernie and Billy thinks they should throw a shindig to welcome her home. Everyone is waiting on Bernie at the pub and surprise, surprise, when she comes in, Bernie is thrilled to be home and to see Paul and is introduced to Moses. She asks for a quick word with Billy and gives him a kiss for looking after her, her Paul. Billy explains how tough things have been, but generally, it's okay. Meanwhile, Paul needs to talk to her about Gemma. So Gemma gets back to the hospital and Joseph is disappointed because this means he'll have to live back at the house with Chesney. And he gives him a hard time for not believing him a million times. He calls Chesney a rubbish dad. Gemma thinks Chesney should maybe give the lad some space. I kind of thought at that point she was going to say, oh... He's up on your old man here, yeah. Joseph. You know, he's, but she doesn't. He's only... He's only looking out for you, he only has your best interests at heart, sort of thing, but not a bit of it. No, because this, it's the exact same thing that she's feeling about Chesney. Right. They're both like, y'all didn't believe us. Yep. And that's why I'm in the hospital. When I think of Chesney's relationship with Joseph, and especially ever since they've had the quads, it's always been, he's a kind of afterthought. Yeah. And he's a kind of inconvenience to Chesney. Right. I'm sure Chesney wouldn't see it that way, but that's no. kind of how it comes across. Absolutely. I mean, it was there for all to see when Joseph ran away from home. Right. He was made to feel like he was a drain on the house when the house needed so much money to keep the quads going. He became a kind of second class citizen in his own house. Right. And just thought he'd 
he'd be better off with Granny Linda and they would be better off without him. Yeah. That wee boy was allowed to think that. Yeah. And Chesney allowed that to happen. Yes, he did. And now he's allowed this to happen. Yeah. And I've said this for a while about Joseph. I like that he's got this kind of old man sensibility about him. Right. He's an old man who's kind of tired of the world and mm-hmm. kind of seen it all and everything's yeah, just... he's an a, old soul. A, everything's just a, a bit of a disappointment and a drain on him. But he's 10. Right. <laughs> and no 10-year-old should feel, feel this like way. this. Yeah. And again, Chesney's allowed this to happen. Right. Whereas Gemma has tried to fight it. Gemma has been in his corner. Gemma has observed what's going on and have you seen what it's done to Gemma? they haven't dyed her hair at the front yeah and it looks like she's graying yeah she's got some gray hair now so she's it looks like this whole thing has just aged her yeah and she's still a young woman yeah she has more gray hair than i do and i'm older than her and again this is something that i think has to Lie at Chesney's door. Yeah. He's allowed this to happen as well. This is a consequence of his disbelief. And taking far too long to recognize what Gemma is feeling right now because she's losing her brother. And it's, as I think it's a strange thing that they've done this a couple of times where Chesney's quite happy to use Paul as an excuse for something. For either doing something or not doing something. And it makes you wonder if that's what he thinks... Gemma thinks right. that Gemma looks on this as an excuse. an excuse for something. Yeah, it's terrible. Chesney is a terrible person. And he's, he's so oblivious to it all. Yeah. And he, in the, today's episode, he still doesn't get it, I don't think. No. I think maybe he hit himself far too hard with that brick that one time. <laughs> I think he did. Later, Bernie gets a text from Gemma about Joseph. Bernie is ready to kill Chesney and Linda, no matter how many times people remind her that she's just got out of prison today. Meanwhile, Glenda moses on over to introduce herself to Moses, and Billy reckons that Todd's got some competition in his hands. Billy makes a big deal of insisting everything is fine, which makes Paul visibly uncomfortable. So, Chesney's stuck at home with Granny Linda. He wishes he'd listened to Joseph and Gemma, and agrees that he's a rubbish dad. In comes Bernie with a question, wanting to know if Gemma is allowed to see the kids now, or does Linda need to speak to a solicitor first? She warns Linda off, pulling a stunt like this ever again. Linda says she just wants a fresh start. Bernie tells her to sling her hook. She's moving back into the house, and Chesney says nothing, while Linda goes off to pack again for a hotel. Back at the hospital, Gemma and Joseph are playing cards. He's sick of the hospital and sick of fucking Chesney. Gemma reminds him that his dad loves him, but just made a mistake and stinks of kebabs. She wants things to get back to being a proper family. Joseph doesn't think he can ignore how let down he was, and Gemma agrees that she's upset too, but families stick together. Back at the God Flat, Paul speaks to Billy about his hopelessly positive attitude, trying to make everything a happy memory, and Billy admits he's just trying to get all the joy he can out of the time that they have together, and promises that he hasn't changed his mind He'll still help when the time comes. So back at the hospital, Joseph is asleep when Chesney comes in, wanting to know the lay of the land. Gemma explains how serious this situation is, but she'll move back. He misinterprets this as things going back to normal and him being forgiven. But that's not what Gemma means. No. She'll move back for the kids, unless it's too much to bear, and then she's off ski. She loves him, but he's hurt her so much, he promises to make it up to her. Kebab? And that's as far as we get with that this week. Ay, ay, ay. I hate what this family is constantly having to go through over and over and over again. They're just going to torture them all to death, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I think we kind of mentioned about the kind of poverty porn aspects of it in the past, but, but here I feel like I'm... I'm kind of relieved that this has kind of come out now. It's like that Gemma's kind of seen what... What Chesney is a terrible human being. I mean, he's not. I don't. I suppose he's not a baddie as such, but his his personality and the way that he's dealt with these situations has has made Joseph sick. Right. Has got Granny Linda planning to get the mafia involved in in the Gemma situation, given Gemma grey hair. Made people think that she's got uh, Munchausen's by proxy. Right. 
and has the social breathing down her neck, writing up God knows how long a report about her right. for, for the making the fatal mistake of uh, mistaking some oil for a tea. Right. That's all she did. Right. Yeah, she didn't understand what her mum said. Which still isn't believable to me because she grew up with her mom. She should know the difference between those two things. I think she's just so permanently tired that mistakes like that are going to happen. Yeah, possibly. But they they made a, a big deal about her mental health a little while ago that kind of seems to have been forgotten again or is used as an excuse now for maybe this is why she's behaving the way that she is. But the fact that nobody's really been on her side apart from... Bernie and Paul makes her such a, a lonely character, yeah, and surrounded by people who essentially don't trust her, right? Yeah, and, and Chesty's the, surely got to think what, what's the what's the worst thing that could happen here if I just go along with this? Because what is the worst thing that's, that's going to if he backs his wife on this? What's the yeah. worst thing that's going to happen? He misses a couple of extra days of school. He gets tired of it and then goes back to school. What does it take just to make an appointment with a doctor just to get them checked out? Right, yeah, because it doesn't feel like they ever like actually went to Gadass with any of this, because it feels like if they did... No, they have, they have it, to wait for him to die on the couch before they do anything. Right, yeah, because... Yeah, she she took him to A&E because he couldn't, they couldn't get into Gadass or something. But, I mean, it takes Gadass, like, asking one question to figure out this mystery. One question. If Chesney can't organise that, or really if Gemma can't organise that, if somebody can't organise taking this wee boy to see the doctor. Right. But Gemma, but... Gemma did, I, I do remember, you know, the fact that she couldn't get him in to see Gaddis right away, and that's why she took him to the A&E those times. And that's believable, because even even here, in this in this glorious country... It's it's like pulling teeth to get a doctor's appointment if you're actually sick and need to see the doctor right away. You're better off going just going to ready care right. than to see your actual doctor. The only reason why I think I'm a little saddened by this is that it's come so quickly after the wedding, mm-hmm. which I really liked. Yeah, and it was nice seeing them kind of happy. Yeah, briefly. And the bright orange wedding dress with the yeah. lights on it and stuff yeah and what a wedding that was yeah for it to for that marriage to fail inside 12 months seems a bit of a, a bit of a shame well chesney but it's chesney you knew yeah. what you were getting into yeah but oh god he's aged her so much it's such a shame because she's such a fun character and I know she's, and now she's kinda, depressed all the time. She's a marmite sort of character. A lot of people don't really care for her. No. Those people are wrong. They are. Yeah, because, you know, even the way that they're, that Chesney and Granny Linda are handling this idea of her having some sort of mental illness is like treating her like she's crazy. Like it's, like it's her fault she has severe depression. Yeah. If she's depressed, what, what do you think is going to help here? I know, let's get Chesney sole custody of the kids. That'll help. What the she's fuck? She's in danger because she's mentally ill. No, that's not how that works, Granny Linda. And why have they done this to Granny Linda? Because they've made her an absolute cow. Oh, yeah, awful. Like, the worst. Whereas before, she was just like, kind of the snooty, rich relative. Snooty interfering. Right, yeah. But she wasn't... Just jumping to let's get you divorced now and get sole custody of the kids sort of thing. And Izzy is right because there there's a point in this story where w- when Gemma is at the bar ignoring Chesney's phone calls that Izzy speaks up and says, I don't get why she's like so upset, so obsessed with Joseph when she's got another grandson here that she hasn't even seen right this trip yeah i don't think izzy and linda have been in the same scene together since the wedding right yeah yeah it's like she she does not acknowledge jake and jake's quite happy with that apparently it, it seems and like so is izzy well izzy's, and now we know why izzy's kind of complaining about it because it's like you know 
I'm sure she would like a big ass fridge too. <laughs> right. Do you think they're going to explode? I don't know. They've split Adam and Sarah up, and they split Daniel and Daisy up, only for like Bethany to not even be in the show <laughs> again. Yeah, she's been in it for like, like half an hour, and that's it. And now she's she's seemingly gone again because there have been lots of plot scenes that she could have been in that involve her mom, yeah, Danny she does, Damien. She doesn't make it to the the plots uh, bistro meeting. No. Where is she? There was an article in a paper or a, a soap magazine that said, well, since Bethany came back, she's been making it clear to everybody that she's a hotshot journalist from big old London. I'm like, have is you she, been watching the show? Have you been watching this show? None of that's happened. No. No, none of that's happened. I hope... Where are you getting your information? I kind of hope that they don't split up. And I kind of hope that Chesney just becomes better. Maybe they go to counselling together. That would be nice. Can they afford it, though? Well, this is uh, the age-old winter brown question, isn't it? Mm. Shouldn't that be covered by the NHS? No. Not if you want it quickly. Anyway, let's move on to our next storyline, because she's worth it. <laughs> on Monday, Max is with Sabrina as he walks to work. As part of his apprenticeship, he has to cut someone's hair, but she tells him to suck her balls. He's not touching her head. No way, no how. Absolutely not. But then they see racist Kelly sitting up outside Nina's rolls, and she looks like she cuts her own hair. So Max <laughs> gets an idea. Max has cut racist Kelly's hair at the salon and, and done it looks a great. smashing job. It looks so good. David literally has never been prouder. And even racist Kelly doesn't hate it. Sabrina and Max invite her round to number eight later and Sabrina tells her to bring her boyfriend along. Racist Kelly clutches her collar a wee bit. So at number eight, Sabrina shows up with Gav who it seems she's trying to set up with racist Kelly. He's not a fan because of the racism. Right. But Sabrina insists that she's not like that really. Not anymore. Although it's never really been, yeah, it's never it, really been resolved. Isn't, isn't that weird <laughs> that they're like, "Oh, I know what we do. We put racist Kelly and Gav together. Mm -hmm. If it means we get more Gav, I'm not opposed to it." Now she looks like Gav is getting somewhere with racist Kelly later, but then she gets a message from her boyfriend and has to rush off like Cinderella. When she's gone, Max and Sabrina doubt that there even is a boyfriend. No one's seen him. And at Nina's Rolls on Wednesday, Sabrina and Max see how Racist Kelly is doing after disappearing last night. They ask after her boyfriend, but Racist Kelly stumbles through some generic answers. It seems that her boyfriend works in IT and Sabrina shows an interest in discussing coding with the boyfriend. Racist Kelly agrees in principle, but says that he works really hard and he hasn't got an awful lot of free time and he lives in Canada now. <laughs> they know she's lying and she knows that they know that she's lying and so does Shona. What gets me is... They say to her, so where does he work? Is he free? Can he come over? What's his job? Do you know what nobody says? What? What's his name? Yeah. Maybe start with, what's his name? Right. Because they just keep on saying, your boyfriend. Right. If they had his name, they could use that in that sentence. Right. Yeah. Where's Keith? John. It's always John, isn't it? John! Isn't that what made-up boyfriend's names are, John? It was Keith. Who dates a Keith? <laughs> Poor Keith. <laughs> Who names a baby Keith? In a quieter moment, sorry, Keith. I didn't mean that. <laughs> yes, he did. I'm called Gavin, for God's sake. It's a lovely name. In a quieter moment, Max brings up the boyfriend thing again with racist Kelly, who suddenly doesn't appreciate the questions. He essentially calls her a liar about it, and racist Kelly understandably doesn't react well to this and demands that he leaves. At number eight, Shona, Max and Sabrina chat about racist Kelly's boyfriend. Sabrina reckons that he must be married. Shona thinks he must be ugly as fuck. Meanwhile, uh, uh. at the flat, racist Kelly is on the phone to her boyfriend, worried that her friends don't think he exists. From her reaction, he doesn't seem to care, so Racist Kelly decides to break it off with him. It seems that this relationship is unconventional at best. Yeah. On Friday, Sabrina and Max come into Nina's roles to see how Racist Kelly is getting on and invite her to the bistro with Gav. Racist Kelly asks for a rain check and explains that she dumped her fella last night. She'll maybe see them later. Daniel sees Racist Kelly on the street and reminds her that she's got some homework due tomorrow. Wait a minute. 
he's not our teacher and she's not his pupil. He's just a he's just a tutor, isn't he? Yeah, but she she has to write an essay for for the for that thing that she's trying to get done for the testing to get her GCSEs or whatever. That's not gonna happen. She promises it'll be done soon, but she's meeting mates in the pub. Max sees the two of them chat from across the street and might just be doing some incorrect mental addition of two and two here. Yes. So Racist Kelly meets up with others in the bistro. They order lemonades all round, but she surprises them when she starts on the old handbag vodka and tops her lemonade up. There was something with Gav, Gav and his... Gav gets a re, gets a alcoholic beverage. What happened there? He showed his ID and then somebody slapped his hand or something and... What? And then took something away and presented something else. I was very confused about what happened there. No, when he was pulling out his... When he was pulling out his ID, a condom slipped out of his oh, wallet. Oh, really? Yes. The old condom in the wallet joke. Yes. Okay, I'm glad I missed it. <laughs> Racist Kelly goes over to get four more lemonades Which Max isn't impressed about He reminds her that everyone else is underage But Racist Kelly is halfway to fucked on the body Gav wonders if she's missing her ex But she slurs as she explains how she's sick of him Whoever he is Sabrina wants to call that day But Racist Kelly's just getting started And she starts dancing and bumping into things Gav doesn't like his bitches drunk he says Toya figures out what's going on And throws them out Demanding a word with Max in private And Toya tells Max that if they go now That'll be the end of it. Yeah, he, she won't tell Nick. She won't tell Uncle Nick because he'll just cry about it. A drunken racist Kelly wants to go out in the town with Gav until he suggests that they go greyhound racing. He doesn't think this is... The what? Real... <laughs> Why does he think that's a fun thing to do? Don't you know what those poor greyhounds go through? Don't... This is... Greyhound racing is so bad, it's banned in this country now. It is banned. What is your problem, Gav? Why do you not like dogs? I don't think we can really go to the UK and gloat about what's banned over here and not over there, can we? I really don't think we can do that. Not with a straight face, anyway. I think we best just move on. Yes, but we don't... We've banned things that hurt puppies. (laughs) Let's just move on. (laughs) You're welcome for the ticks. He doesn't think this is the real her. Call back after a week. <laughs> he doesn't think this is real her, so he knocks her back and she stomps off in the huff. Max and, and says Gav that he's boring anyway. Go to see Racist Kelly at the flat. Racist Kelly says there's nothing up and she was just having a laugh with her mates. She doesn't want to talk about her ex. Max doesn't understand why she doesn't say who it is and asks if it's Daniel. She throws up in her mouth a wee bit <laughs> yeah, and says it's does. not. Her ex is just the latest in a line of scumbags. Gav offers to be her mate. He says, that's what you need, more than your whole. Yes. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Which is very nice. It was weird that she goes from having this freshly cut head of hair to when she goes out with her mates, she steals her mum's dress from the 1990s and, and puts a Madonna hair extension ponytail on the top of her head. It was her mum's dress? It it did not look like a dress from this century. I I couldn't tell. I, I was far too confused about where the dress stopped and the sleeves started because the sleeves just looked like big gloves. It was like a keyhole dress. Sort I didn't of thing. see that the sleeves were attached to the rest of the dress though. <laughs> they looked just like arm warmers. Were you confused that all of a sudden her hair is very long? I honestly didn't notice her hair. <laughs> that she had like one of those. Yeah, because she had like a like a wrap around braid thing, and then she had these long. She looked like she looked like. Remember when Madonna did that in the nineteen nineties? No, I don't understand how they dressed that poor girl in this show. If it's not a crop top, I ain't interested. <laughs> and frankly, I'm not interested anyway. No, but it's always seems to be with the crop tops with her. Right? Yeah. Show as much skin as humanly possible while still being legal. I, I, I guess. But also wearing sweats with those crop tops. Yeah. She's like Sporty Spice. She dresses like Sporty Spice. And she kind of... Sporty Spice did that thing with her hair once too. I remember. I remember her whipping her, her braid around like uh, Willow Smith that one time. 
before Willow Smith was born. <laughs> Probably. Sure. Because do you know you Willow have, Smith, she, she whips her hair back and forth. Do you forth. have any... Uh, moving on. Do you have any idea who Racist Kelly's boyfriend is? I imagine it has to be somebody we know. Is it Griff? Griff's in jail. Is he, though? Yeah. Because if tried to blow Weatherfield up <laughs> he and he would have got away with it too if it weren't for those pesky Alia <laughs> he did blow Alia up though remember she came back and she had right. covered in suit and her right. the sleeves and of her holding her side yeah 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 because apparently you could get blown up and walk back home and then stabbed later and still not go and see her see the hospital I feel like it's got to be somebody we know but I can't think of anybody. I've heard Damon's name come up and, quite a bit. And I don't... In, in fan theories of... I don't feel that's believable. I don't think it's believable that he's with Racist Kelly. Another theory and that I heard Sarah at the was same time. that he is going to end up cheating on Sarah with Bethany. No. <laughs> what was that noise again? No. <laughs> Yes, it was. That's that's as bad as when there were fan theories that that Ryan and yes, we're gonna Doctor, <laughs> Doctor Ali. Yes, that Ryan and Doctor Ali were were going to be a little incestuous with one another. Well, as incestuous as two people who aren't at all related to each right, other, right? Who aren't be. biological. But let's remember, our kids threw up in their mouths a little bit when we watched Clueless. I, I agree with them. That's They're a, not biologically related either. It's still horrible. It's still yikes. Yeah, but you seem okay with Ryan and Dr. Alley. Did I, where did I sound <laughs> all right about that? Well, you're like, well, they're not biological. All I'm just saying is it's not incestuous. Alicia Silverstone and Paul Rudd were also not biological. I don't know if it makes a difference that they're opposite sexes. Maybe that's what something has got to do with it. I don't know. Maybe I'm homophobic. Who knows? No, you're the opposite of homophobic because you have a problem with Alicia Silverstone. You, you're you have a problem with the heterosexual version. You don't have a problem with the homosexual version. Well, they were older as well. Eh, I, I I guess Alicia Silverstone was in high school in that movie. She was a senior in high school in that movie. And Paul Rudd was in college. Oh it's, yeah, it's just got yikes written all over it. <laughs> and the kids agree, so that means I'm right. <laughs> Yeah. Are we going to talk about any other Paul Rudd movies tonight? Because we've hope, talked about Ant-Man. I hope not. And we've talked about <laughs> Clueless. What's next? Wet Hot American Summer? Halloween f- 5? Is it 5? The one, new of, ghost- one of the Halloween movies? The new Ghostbusters? Oh God, let's not talk about that. <laughs> no, I don't know who it is, but the fact that we're not getting a name... And we're not even getting a vague description. No. I think it's got to be somebody that we know. It's somebody who has access to a phone. That's all we really right. know. And somebody with with expendable cash. Oh. A bit of a sugar daddy. Oh, is it that, um, that counsellor, maybe? Ew. God, we haven't seen him in ages. P-Gate Lane. <laughs> Ew, that would be gross. I think whoever it is, it's going to be gross. Do you think it could be Jacob? No. Is that how Jacob is going to get back in the show? No, that would... And then Amy will be really sad. No, I don't think it's him. I'm beginning to think it's that counsellor. That's gross, man. So gross. That's grosser than Daniel, and she threw up in her mouth she did. about Daniel. Let us know your theories of who the boyfriend is. The talk of the street at gmail.com. Who's another scumbag on the show? We've mostly gotten rid of the scumbags. Who knows? We shall maybe find out next week. Maybe. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, I believe. Oh, the, the fans are going to be outraged. Probably football. Who knows? Something the next storyline is nearly killing Adi again. <laughs> At the hospital, Adi is getting discharged and Dave insists that he moves back home. And I was like, oh, don't do that. Just fix the flat in the precinct and Addy out living his best life as a nearly dying <laughs> from carbon monoxide poisoning living his best life as a single man about town was quite a nice little 
I say it often, or I expect often. I, I quite, was it? Yeah, I'm moving back home is like such a step backwards. Eh, he's still not working for Dev anymore. So right, so at he's least independent. he's got his independence there. I just sad to hear that Nina has moved out because she and Asha have broken up. Asha puts on a brave face. And Nina's Rolls Roy is trying to cheer Nina up with comfort food. She asks if she can move back in. Roy offers her a rolled room and promises to speak with Evelyn because Evelyn's using it at the moment. Yes. So Asher goes to Addy's flat to help him pack, but on their way out, he sees her bracelet that he got her for her birthday on the floor. And Addy's a smart boy and realises that this means Asher was there while he was unconscious. Yeah. Back home and Asher's apologies fall on deaf ears. And when Dev finds out, he's fucking furious too. Because it falls on Dev ears. Uh Uh-huh. If anyone gets to leave Addy for dead, it's him, he says. <laughs> Asha claims to be ashamed, and maybe paramedic work isn't for her. Addy agrees and storms out. Nina and Roy are wondering how they're going to tell Evelyn that she's going to need to move out when she comes in from another storyline and announces that she'll be moving out anyway to look after the girls while Phil Tyrone is away. In Italy. Belter. Having, laying about having his ACL heal. No action required there. That's the best. Andy goes to speak to Amy and explains about Asha leaving him for dead. Amy's concern is immediately for Asha and hopes that she doesn't pack in her course because of this. She reminds Addy of how upset she was about splitting up with Nina and reminds him why that happened. Nina goes to get the rest of her stuff from Dev's and it's awkward between her and Asha but it's good and proper over now. Nina leaves without saying goodbye. Addy apologises for everything, says he's sorry about the two of them and doesn't think that she should quit her course. Addy thinks it's her calling or whatever, and surely she can't be rubbish at everything. <laughs> with this pep talk, Asha agrees to rethink her decision to quit, and that's as far as we get with that this week. Nice. I think that's that seems to be Asha and Nina 100% Done. out now. Yeah. For the best, really, isn't it? Yeah. Next time they do this, do it with a bit more conviction. Right, yeah. Try and sell it to us a little bit better. Yeah, We'd probably care a bit more. Don't just like push two characters together and say, now kiss, as if they're like toy no. toy action figures. Yep, or a salt and pepper container. <laughs> and a ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not. Let's, Let's not. Ho, ho, ho. Sometimes we get weird when we're not on the podcast. <laughs> and that's all you need to know. I think we best move on then. <laughs> yes, please. Our next storyline is Evelyn's puppies. On Monday, Cassie finds Evelyn in Dev's shop. She's given all the money she stole to a dog charity. What was the point of that then? Unless she's lying. Hmm. Evelyn believes her and seems to have forgiven her at least a bit. Cassie reminds her that she did rescue a shitload of puppies. And Evelyn shakes her head. Tyrone drops in later to announce that Fizz is off to Italy for a, a convenient treat holiday from Angelique, who I vaguely remember. Tyrone has been asked to go too, but he's worried about leaving the girls with Cassie for a fortnight. Evelyn goes to have a word with Cassie. It turns out Terry the ruffian has pled guilty and is likely to get a custodial sentence. And another news, she's going to move back in while Ty and Fizz fuck off to Italy. And Cassie does not look pleased. Behind Tyrone's back, Evelyn got him time off work and got Fizz booking flights and she's moving back in to help. Tyrone thinks this is an accident waiting to happen, but can do nothing other than agree to go, and goes off to get packing. In his smashing Calumet, Michigan t-shirt. Which is a tiny little village of 600 people. In the UP. Way up north in the UP. Yeah. The it's, Upper Peninsula. It's near Houghton. Yeah. That's how far north it's it is. It's way up there. It's practically Canada. It's practically Canada. Where did he get that t-shirt from? I'm dying to know because it wasn't us. It wasn't us. And uh, Sabrina was wearing a Michigan t-shirt as well. But she's worn that before. She has. Yeah. But they were wearing them in the same episode. Because <laughs> she, really? plays, she plays basketball in that shirt. She does. It's a U of M yes. t-shirt or vest or whatever. Ooh. Yeah. Well, it, see, oh, it pairs please. quite nicely with Tyrone's uh, Spartans, Spartans t-shirt. Yeah. Which he wasn't wearing, though. I don't think he's got that anymore. It's been so long since we've seen it. But where did that T-shirt come from? 
We're it's just on, such a random, tiny it's little town. So random. It's 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 the most random T-shirt he's ever worn. I Because I've thought about sending them, and I kind of wish we had when we sent them the Spartan shot and that we sent them a neat t-shirt. rapid shot as well. But this is. This little town is like a tenth of the size of Eaton Rapids, even. Right. And Eaton Rapids is tiny. Yeah. We should get a Greyhound shirt for Gav. <laughs> oh, well, looks like I'm off buying shirts again this weekend. It's <laughs> so on Wednesday. At Tyrone's, Cassie is getting Ruby ready for school, which means doing her nails extensions instead of feeding her. Right. Or Ca- packing her a lunch. Cassie had a weird earpiece. In- Did she? The shot from behind her head, you could see she had like like a little. I didn't notice. Like a f- FBI informant, or maybe it's a hearing aid or something. Never noticed that before, and I thought maybe the fact that the camera was right behind her ear that was going to be important, but it mm-hmm. turned out that it wasn't. No, but I'm just curious as to what it is. I didn't notice it. Evelyn comes in shocked that Ruby hasn't left for school and suspects that she hasn't made packed lunches that Cassie hasn't made packed lunches Mm -hmm. she sends Cassie off to work already regretting this arrangement Cassie comes home for lunch and is put out when Evelyn hasn't made it Evelyn spells it out for her she's here to look after the girls not look after Cassie and Cassie is the one that's supposedly going to help her then she gets a call from the school about Ruby's nails apparently she can't pick up a pencil which is hilarious back home Ruby apologises for getting Cassie into trouble Cassie warns Ruby not to spend her life trying to impress people especially with fake nails Ruby says no one likes her at school and Cassie can understand and tells her to just be herself. Yeah, that everybody likes hope. hope best. You're Ruby. Evelyn overhears this and seems to approve of Cassie being a proper parent. And later, Evelyn is impressed at the housework Cassie has done today and is grateful and thinks that she's doing a decent job. But then it seems Cassie has put Bart Simpson's lucky red hat in with the whites. Yes. And that's as far as we get with that. She's pulled a Paddington. <laughs> yes. That was a nice little bit on on Wednesday with with Ruby. Yeah, it's nice to have Ruby be the one in the scene. Now, what surprises me though, and this goes back to old Ruby as well, Mm -hmm. I can't imagine anybody not liking Ruby. She's a wee delight. She is. And now that she's got the new head and she can sing, She's, she should be popular with that mob as well, I would have thought. Yeah. So the fact that she's supposedly not popular just strikes me as being a little odd. It kind of, I, I can see, I can see how she could get overshadowed by her sister. That people are more hope than Ruby. Hope is the more outgoing one, the more extroverted one. The dangerous to no one. Right, yeah. The one who takes up all the oxygen. Whereas Ruby is fairly quiet and kind of in the background and not attempting murder. <laughs> yeah, she, I guess she's, uh, she has the good girl that's just sitting, getting her work done quietly right. and not causing any fuss. Absolutely. Sort of thing, but I don't know. It, it seemed weird hearing her say that, though, and made me quite sad. It made me sad as well. Because... I mean, throughout whichever head she's had on, I've always quite liked Ruby as a character. Yes. She's always been a sweetheart. So how long do you think Tyrone and Fizz are really going to end up in Italy? And is this going to delay Fizzy's comeback? Well, that I'm still desperately waiting on. Well, if I, I seem to remember that it takes like six months for an ACL to heal or something. They can probably get around it by just making them sit down an awful lot. They've said he's got, this is a fortnight holiday. When this goes on for like three months and he's still not back, people are going to start asking questions. Right. He's booked off with Aggie, who we still don't know where she is. No, and if, if, I, I don't think we can say any more than we've already said on that matter. No, it kind of feels like she's never coming back, which is sad. And the, the further the Ed story goes the more noticeable that becomes. Yes. Oh, well, our final storyline tonight is this wee prick again. Ugh. I thought they'd forgotten about this. I was hoping they'd forgotten about this. I see a little ray of light here, though, and and maybe, maybe you'll agree when we get to it. 
On Wednesday, Liam is walking to the bus stop with Maria and Gary. They meet Jack there, who's going to school despite being in his mid-40s. <laughs> Liam pretends to have forgotten a book, so fucks off home. And Jack looks like he doesn't believe him. And at also that he doesn't care. At home, Liam has... Yes, Jack's <laughs> just there for no reason. Right. He's like, all right, fine. You don't have to announce it. He's there for Liam to say, I forgot my book too. Right. Because you can't have the audience just realising that Liam's just decided to walk away right. for no reason. Yes. At home, Liam has logged into school to excuse his own absence. Which? Gary's password is password. <laughs> or Canada. How, how do you get away with excusing an absent absence online that feels so wrong a thing to be able to do we can't do that we have to actually call in mm -hmm. and then it's the school fair. and then the school phones you later anyway right as in gary are in nina's roles talking about the size of chesney's new fridge in comes maria who's had a call from the school about liam's absence he hasn't been in school for a week Gary smells a wee bit of shite under his nose. So Gary and Maria go home to read Liam the riot act. They think this has something to do with that Mason kid, or maybe Dylan. But Liam refuses to grasp and says he just doesn't like school because he hates his new PE teacher. Which is believable. It is believable. So Gary grounds him and sends him to his room. Neither he nor Maria believe a word of it. And later, Liam is sticking to his story. Maria's still worried that he's been bullied. Gary recalls bunking off tons when he was Liam's age and reckons that being that age is difficult. Maria thinks Liam is different and thinks talking to his teachers might be an idea. Something's definitely up though and she's determined to find out. And when Maria gets a bee under her bonnet about something, yeah. she ain't letting go of that. No. So on Friday, Liam just flat out refuses to go to school because of the PE teacher thing and he challenges Gary or Maria to make him go. So Maria makes him go. Yes, she does. She drags him to the bus stop and sits and waits on the bus with him and makes sure he gets on. And he gets on with Dylan, the cowardly lion, who blanks him. But it turns out Liam's left his phone in the bus shelter. Mar Maria shouts on the bus, but it's too late. So she rushes to the school to give Liam his phone in the playground. And right enough, this is a redneck. This is, this is horrible. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. If you're that age and your mum turns up in the playground of the school... That's, that's, you're getting absolutely slated for that for a year. If you're a, if you're a 15 year old, 14 year old boy, 15 year old boy, and your mum turns up in the playground of the school, not at the gate, in the grounds of the school, you're getting pelters for that for a month at least. The kids are constantly texting me, asking me to bring them their things to the school. What does that prove? <laughs> it's it's just you left your phone. Here's your phone. It's yeah. not that big of a deal. Yeah. And oh, how does Benny react when you're like, oh, Benny, boopy doo? When he's on the on the PlayStation with his pals, he fucking hates it. Yeah, but Maria doesn't say, oh, Benny, poopy doo. I don't say Benny, poopy doo. What does poopy doo mean? I don't know. You're the one that says it. I don't. <laughs> I don't at all. That's such a weird thing to say, but... It's yeah, so a weird thing for you to say. I agree. <laughs> I've never said poopy too before in my life, except on this podcast tonight. You've, you've said it constantly, anyway. and it seems to be tripping over your lips rather easily. <laughs> the point is, the, 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 those that age here. of boy in particular is easily embarrassed, and is easily embarrassed by a parent. And is easily embarrassed by a parent who turned up and is in the school grounds during, uh, well, it's not really recess because the school hasn't started yet, but the playground is full of kids. Why does their school have a playground? They're in like high school, aren't they? Yeah, high schools have playground areas. Well, it's not Our good. high school doesn't have a playground <sighs> area. No high school in America has recess or a playground you always have to get from one class to the other and you get a 15 minute break and then you get a break at lunchtime and then you get a break in the afternoon. To swing on swings and go down a slide? No, to kick a football about and smoke. It feels like the most innocuous thing. The only reason she goes is to give him his phone 
and that's it. And then she leaves. She doesn't. No, she doesn't. She doesn't just do that. She shouts to them, "Let me have a good day," and she makes a a a little bit of a drama out of it. Right. She doesn't give him a hug. She doesn't do that. But she, she doesn't, doesn't give him just, a smooch. She doesn't just hand over the phone and leave. She doesn't do just that though. Yeah, she talks to him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to talk to her because he's at school and there's people watching. Uh, people who one would think also have mums. Yeah, and who'd behave exactly the same way if their mums had shown up. Why are boys dumb? There are more embarrassing things that a parent can do than hand him his phone, yell at him a little bit for forgetting his phone, and telling him to have a nice day. Of course there are more embarrassing things, but that doesn't make that not embarrassing. I wouldn't be embarrassed by that. I would have been affronted if my mother had turned up at school when I was at school. She never did. Yeah, my mother never showed up at my high school, like, in the middle of the day, because my high school was 30 miles away from my house. Where did we get to? I don't know. She turned up at school. She turned up at school. And I think we all agreed that that was a really bad idea for it her to do It wasn't. That. He needs his phone. What, is she gonna, Does he? She, what, is she going to go home and just keep his phone there? If she that had would taken, have been a better idea. Right, because then she would have seen those messages. Right. The rat messages, which I don't know why he keeps looking at. Why would you do that to yourself? He can't take his eyes off it. It's mesmerizing, apparently. And since when was his room just covered in skulls? That's kind of worrying. Anyway. So, yeah, so he's uh, ignored again by Dylan the Cowardly Lion. And Maria wants to know why, but the bell goes and Liam has her off and Maria shouts them, have a good day. Mason sees her leave and has recorded the two of them talking. So Mason right, shows that's a normal thing to do. So Mason shows a video to Dylan in school and they chat about how Liam is such a fucking loser in a grass. And Mason's obsession over Liam might be hiding a tendency or three, one suspects. I think he's jealous because Liam has a mum that cares about him. I have a feeling his family are all shit. Yeah, and a mum who's super hot. And terrible. And like has left him alone to, like, go date gangsters since he was two. When yeah, his dad I, ran off with the babysitter. We haven't seen his parents yet, but yeah. I imagine that they'll be like that. It's also interesting that Dylan chooses to join in mocking Liam's parents <laughs> when his dad is Sean. Well, he probably just doesn't want... To remind Mason that this his is dad is Sean. He's a coward. Yeah. This is why he's a coward. Yeah, he's terrible. I hate that kid. And then there's Rose. Gary can understand why Liam was upset at school. Maria reckons there's something else to it and tells Gary about Dylan being an asshole. Gary thinks Liam has other mates. Like who, says Maria. And he can't name one. Liam was eating lunch on his own when Mason comes over and snatches his phone saying he's going to piss all over it if Liam doesn't get down on his hands and knees and beg for it. Liam asks him why he's doing this. And Where mean, are the teachers? And meanwhile, cowardly Dylan stands behind Mason and says nothing. Where are the teachers? Where, where the, are, is there no staff in that school? Nobody sees this going There's on? Mrs. Crawshaw and she can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, but there are other teachers. There's, there's, there's got to be other teachers in that school, right? Daniel left. <laughs> there's got to be others. Mrs. Crawshaw. Who's the assistant headmaster, so there's a headmaster somewhere. Right, and there are teachers somewhere. What is going on here? So you insist, but I've never seen evidence of any. Liam initially does beg a little bit, but then realises that that's not going to get him anywhere, and no. he runs off. But Mason corners him in the hallway and throws him up against a wall, threatening to give him stitches. So Liam, smart laddie, he hits a fire alarm, and he should have spat in Mason's face there, yes. or need him in the nuts, yes. or both. Right, maybe he would have dropped his phone and he would have his phone now. So everyone files out while Liam scappers and Mason grasses up Liam to Crawshaw. Right. He's he's a much bigger grass than Liam is. Seriously. Seriously. And yet, he's not smart enough to notice. Gary and Maria are still in Nina's roles <laughs> when Maria gets a call from the school. She goes off to take it while Daniel sympathises with Gary about how difficult year 10s can be basing this on his extensive experience when he was a teacher in a proper school for six months. 
Maria comes back, now fully abreast of the fire alarm business. At home, they speak to Liam, who says school was fine. Maria asks him about the fire alarm. Liam says, no one can prove nothing. No one saw nothing, see? He was messing around with some mates and accidentally hit the alarm, but he refuses to name those mates or say that he's been bullied. Maria begs him to tell her what's happening. Liam admits to being picked on but doesn't want to share any more and says Mason and Dylan weren't involved and that Maria is blowing this all out of proportion. Later, Jake has a word with Liam. It seems Mason has been in touch on the PlayStation saying that Liam can get his phone back if he meets Mason outside the science block tomorrow. Liam's still a smart cookie. He reckons this is a trap and he'll just keep his head down. (laughs) He'll just keep his head down until Mason gets bored and starts picking on someone else. He's, he hasn't gotten bored yet. He tells Jake to ignore the message. And later, Gary and Maria still want a name. Maria is going to speak to Crawshaw and the governors about this tomorrow. Gary says violence is the only language bullies understand, but then realises what he's just said, <laughs> and then says, but it's never the answer. And he asks Liam to let him and his mum deal with it. Liam goes to speak to Jake. He's changed his mind. He'll meet Mason outside the science block after all. And that's how we end this week's episodes. Now, my little glint of hope in all this is that Liam is going to boot the fuck out of Mason at the science block tomorrow. He's going to borrow Cassie's baseball bat. Plug him over the head. See, I've got a memory, and it's probably a false memory. This Uh probably never happened. But I've got a memory of Liam doing self-defense classes or doing karate or something. I don't know, maybe it wasn't him. I've got a memory of some kid in a I, in a karate uniform or a judo uniform or something. I think that was something. Joseph. Was it? I seem to remember Joseph was into karate for a while, but then couldn't continue because, you know, Line poverty disease. porn. Yeah. But... But I think Gary said to him, about violence. Mm-hmm. Now, Liam seems to have his head screwed on properly when it comes to bullies. Or at least he has a plan. His plan is just to ride this out. It's not going to last forever. Mason will move on to somebody else. And that, I think, is typically how bullies work. No, that's not how bullies work. They continue to be your bully until you start going to different schools. I mentioned Dorothy Armstrong last night. You know, you know when she stopped bullying me? When she went to NFA and I went to Woodstock. I don't know if that's typical though. That's like four years. I don't know I don't know how typical that is. I think it's obviously your experience, but I don't know if the experience of other people is because I because this seems to ring true that some bullies, let's say then, move on when when they're not getting anything out of this, when the, the when they're not getting any enjoyment out of it anymore, they go and pick on somebody else. Because there's always somebody else. Maybe maybe that's not your experience, but maybe it's other people's. It seems, it seems to make sense. There are only so many people in a school. Well, yeah, it depends on how big the school is. Weatherfield and Manchester in their city school was probably quite big. Hmm. And yet they have no teachers. Well, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You're not believing me, though. No. So, anyway, he seems to have... At least a uh, working knowledge of what I think is a popular belief of bullies. Mm-hmm. But he also but seems he, to be really upset by what's going on. Yes. You know, he sits it, in his room and cries. By reading the right. things called him a rat and right. stuff. And then he deletes them. How can he delete them? Are they just, are these DMs that are being sent to him? What website is he on? It's send pics. It's. Corey's answer to Instagram. That, now, don't a, say that you can't do this on Instagram because that's not what it's on. It's on send pics. I think it's supposed to be the equivalent of Snapchat. Gary's words seem to have some kind of uh, effect on him and give him some kind of idea that he's going to deal with this now. He's had enough. He can't take no more. No more can he take. He's going to get some satisfaction and and try and turn the tables. Right. I feel like we're unbelievably too early in the storyline for that to happen. So I can only imagine that it backfires, but I, I don't one know. Would hope I don't know. I feel like the storyline should have ended months ago. 
It's huh? a terrible storyline. Nobody likes it. Let's just get it over with. But yeah, it feels like it's going to backfire. He's going to really hurt Mason. And that's when we're going to finally meet Mason's family. We're going to sue the fuck out of Maria and Gary. Oh, probably. We're, we're reaching and then it one turns, pivot point of right, the story. And then it becomes, and then the storyline becomes Liam is a bully when Liam is in fact not a bully. Right. But Mason is able to convince people, even though he's not very smart, that right. Liam is a bully. And Liam's deleted all the messages, so now he doesn't have any proof. And right. All that. And so it's going to rely on Dylan to step up and and have his corner. And Dylan's and not going to do that because he's such a cowardly lie. And, and such a... As bad as, as Mason is, um, I almost hate Dylan more for his abandonment of Liam. Yeah. Because Dylan's been on the receiving end of this. Right. He left London because of this. And, and, but he's been on the receiving end of this from Mason. Right. And has quickly deflected it onto Liam. Right. So he's, he's kind of complicit in it. Mm-hmm. And it, it ain't a good look. No. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> that was the week that was Coronation Street then, I guess. What was your moment of the week? Oh. Uh, Bernie's homecoming? Yeah, it wasn't that good. Yeah, that was nice. It was a quick three months. It was a quick month and a half for good behaviour. That's probably been about a month and a half, isn't it? Yeah. She missed Christmas. Ish. Yeah, feels. Yeah, probably. Let's, right. They're like she missed Christmas. Her she suffered enough. Let's not get the calendar out. That probably works out time wise. Yeah. Let's say that Bernie's uh, timely release from prison, and and the the if, homecoming party at the at the rovers. That one booth in the rovers. That yeah. is our. Moment of the week. Uh, moment of the week. Uh, boring moment of the week. Kirk needing to have a cup of tea before he moves to the refrigerator. What was that all about? Why was he even there? I thought he was going to be there once we saw where that storyline went. That he would have been the one that said, "Oh, that sounds like Lyme disease." Because Liam, because because Kirk, I don't know, <laughs> goes out ferreting or something. <laughs> Who knows? Kirk looks like he's a guy that ferrets, doesn't he? Goes out with his ferret and hunts rabbits and stuff. He knows what Lyme disease is, but it doesn't have anything to do with that. He's but, just there to get a cup of tea and have and some biscuits. And maybe move the refrigerator. Yeah. Because Chesney can't move a refrigerator by himself. It's a big refrigerator. If that thing falls, Chesney's dead. That's true. Give it a go, Chesney. <laughs> that is our boring moment of the week. Oh well. Oh well. Uh, yeah, your score for this week then? Mm, four and a half. Yeah, it wasn't as good as last week. No. Although I did like Joseph getting some some of this stuff off his chest. And I actually quite liked Liam's performance in the bully storyline. I just hate the bullying storyline. Oh, me too. I think everyone does. And I think and I we're feel... all done with young people storylines as right. well. Yeah, I'll I... give it a five. And I feel like the Winter Browns have had enough. And, you know, rewriting... Granny Linda as not just an interfering rich lady, but an actual cow yeah. is kind of terrible. It's not done it any favours, that's for sure. All right, this episode is brought to you with thanks to our friends of the podcast, Daisy, French Helen, Pickles, DT, Trisha, Wendy, Noel, Canadian Helen, Christine, Shandy. Thank you. If you've ever dropped trow in a coffee shop to show your doctor a mole, write in to tell us about it, don't tell your doctor. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Quarry Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Threads and Blue Sky. You can shout me and Helen a coffee or become a friend of the podcast by heading to ko-fi.com, that's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out the clicky clicky section of vogel.co.uk for links to our merch store and YouTube channel. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. And be sure to check out our pop culture sister podcast, The List of Lists. We're going through the Oscars! Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. And we will be back next week with more... A Talk of the Street! The Talk of the Street! Bye. Cheerio!